Great, would you like me to share my screen already? Uh, yes, so you can go ahead and share your screen, you know. Um, Everybody, it's a pleasure and honor to have Ila feed with us for the next installment of Living Histories today. Uh, Ila, it's such a pleasure. Please tell us about Living Many Histories. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, just so you know, you're not in presenter mode right now and you can see the back of your screen. Ah, okay. Here we are. Can you see the screen now? All set. Over to okay, you. Perfect. Sri, thank you so much for having me. This is a this is a, a very unusual and, and a really special talk format. And uh, the only thing I'm upset about is that I'm coming after JC. She did such a phenomenal job. I feel like I'm never I'm not going to be able to live up to this remarkable geometric approach that she took to storytelling going backwards and forwards in time. Uh, mine's gonna be rather linear, but as I promised. If you have me back, I'll try to do it in the spiral. Um, so, all right, so what is my story of coming up in science? So first of all, um, just a brief introduction to what uh, we do uh, in my group. So I'm a, a trained as a physicist, but uh, I work in computational and theoretical neuroscience now. And this is just a, you know, a, a brief introduction of you know, one kind of thing that, that we've been doing in my group lately. So um, what I'm trying to show you here, and my screen has been obscured, is oh wow okay that's good um so what what i'm showing you here is um some of the work we've been doing uh we've been trying to understand in general my group tries to understand some of the neural substrates for memory and how the brain integrates various sources of information um, across different sensory modalities how it does that over time um, and in fact one really remarkable example of integration in the brain is uh, how we uh, integrate our movements as we move through the world and maintain a continuous updated estimate of our position as we're moving through the world. Even with our eyes closed, but with our eyes open, we um, not only integrate our own velocities, but we use external cues to then update our estimates of position, build maps of the world and so on. So we've been um, studying spatial memory and um, some of the same circuits that are involved in spatial memory um, are also involved in just our general memory systems uh, for what we call episodic memory, which is our ability to remember autobiographical details of events, like who did I meet, where did I meet them, when did I meet them, what happened, et cetera, right? So someone brought up the movie Memento, not too dissimilar from, you know, the story was that this patient, this person had hippocampal damage and was unable to form new um, um, memories. Okay, so um, the kinds of things that we do is uh, we, we do theoretical work, but we also do some, you know, work with uh, neural data uh, to validate our uh, uh, our theoretical models. And here's just one uh, example that I think is uh, a lot of fun. Uh, uh, this is from collaborators who record multiple cells simultaneously in the brain in one particular brain nucleus called um, ADN, part of the thalamus that relays information to cortex. And here is a simultaneous recording of many cells as an animal is just running around in, in 2D. And I am not able to use my cursor for some strange reason. Um, um, click on click on the mouse and then you'll be able to advance. Oh, and then I should be, ah, you're right. Okay, indeed. So here's an animal running around, like it's just kind of doing its, it's doing its own thing. It can just run around freely, scavenge for like little bits of Cheerios or something. And we get all these cell recordings and we can take snapshots and construct a population activity vector. So this is like one snapshot of across the population the responses of cells, we can throw it up in some high dimensional space, we can parameterize the manifold structure of the cloud of data points and apply some topological data analysis tools. And topology has become sort of a big uh, way to try to characterize neural data um, and also try to characterize what how the brain represents information about the world. So we can characterize the shape of this point cloud and then parameterize along that point cloud and then do unsupervised decoding of the states. And here is something truly remarkable, I think, that makes neuroscience gratifying on a daily basis. This is a circuit of about thousands of neurons, and this is the states uh, of, of, of that whole circuit. Um, each dot represents the state at one moment in time. And you can see that all the states of this like several thousand neuron circuit lie on this simple one-dimensional ring. This is a one-dimensional. So it turns out that this circuit is responsible for maintaining an estimate of compass direction as animals run around the world and um, you know they get a sense of where they are even as they're turning um, and um, it turns out that the circuit is a memory circuit it also maintains 
uh, this estimate of the same states and sleep uh, in green and in waking. So anyway, these are the kinds of things that we do. Um, here is, uh, this is, that was on the data analysis side. Uh, we also work on questions about cognition and how it is that when we read a sentence like the following, the woman brought the sandwich from the kitchen, tripped. Okay, now this sounds really ungrammatical. First, you're thinking about the woman brought the sandwich from the kitchen, tripped. So, of course, the way to interpret this question, the, the sentence is that once you realize that the woman tripped, then it means that she was the woman who was brought the sandwich from the kitchen, tripped. So this is what you call a classic garden path sentence in cognitive science, and it just causes a reorientation in your brain of how to understand the previous parts of the sentence when you see um, this word. Here's another fun one. Time flies like an arrow, fruit, fly, fruit flies like a banana. Um, so once again, these garden path sentences. So there's this mental shift from one frame of understanding to another frame. This is related to mapping. We talk about spatial maps. This is like mental cognitive maps. And um, we do some of the mathematics and, um, and, and analysis of how the brain can do these kinds of processing, how it represents these kinds of um, pieces of information. Okay, so not to dwell too much on the science, but that's what keeps me up at night. That's what I dwell on in the day. Um, and I am so lucky to be in this field of neuroscience, which is really exploding. And it has historically had lots of influence from uh, theoretical physicists who moved from uh, physics into biology, into neuroscience specifically. Um, and, 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 and those individuals have had a profound in fact, uh, impact on, on the field and, and have shaped it. Now, on my personal trajectory, uh, uh, I guess where I am right now, I am a professor at MIT. Uh, I have moved here from Austin, Texas, where I had a group uh, for 10 years. Uh, so that was my first faculty position. Before that, I was in um, Caltech as a Broad Fellow. Uh, it was an independent postdoc position. Before that, I was in UC Santa Barbara, the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics. And before that, I was at Harvard University, and I'll get into that a little bit. But the way I got to where I am is um, uh, this, this long um, trajectory here, where uh, my family um, comes from Rajasthan, this desert state in, um, in India. And um, that was um, several generations ago, uh, four generations ago. Um, they, uh, there were many waves of migration out of Rajasthan that led to um, you know, the, uh, the um, uh, gypsies who went to uh, the west, to Europe, and then also to the east, um, uh, Rajasthani spread out across a lot of India and became prominent business people. Um, my family is also a business family that left Rajasthan, established itself in Uttar Pradesh in the north of India, and my parents' families are all in business, so um, they both do, they do small and family retail businesses, they also have wholesale businesses. They started out by running a reinsurance business, doing um, reinsurance of insurance companies that insure um, boats that would uh, carry goods on the Ganges. Um, and uh, and uh, they also run regional retail businesses now. So uh, three generations ago, um, nobody in my family had um, any college degrees or even any high school degrees. Um, two generations ago, or actually, uh, you know, if I'm G G1, then G2 would be my 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 father's generation. Um, he left uh, the business track and went into mathematics. Influenced three of his other brothers to leave um, business and go into math and astrophysics. And so they went from having no college degrees and no high school degrees to having four PhDs in one generation. Um, and uh, and uh, there was one college degree in um, the females in the generation above me. And um, I was very privileged to already have been raised by my father, who took, uh, you know, an interest in our education, although he never indoctrinated us to do mathematics or science uh, or, or anything. Um, but he certainly created an environment where um, I realized how special it was to have a chance to just spend your life in a creative occupation where you could sort of almost selfishly indulge yourself um, and get paid to ask questions that, you know, we all would like to ask as children and we get to continue doing that as adults. So I realized early on how special that was. 
And um, I really knew not much else um, growing up, even though my father, my family were in business, but I grew up with my father um, and my mother in Mumbai. So my father moved from the Uttar Pradesh to Mumbai, where he joined um, the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research. And then he moved to Michigan um, uh, uh, in mid-career. And uh, that's where I went to undergrad. And then subsequently I've moved to where I am on the East Coast. Um, so here is uh, where I grew up. It's a very beautiful and very special place. It's in the very southern tip of Bombay, um, previously called Bombay, now Mumbai. And um, this building here with the orange star. Oh, again, I cannot really move my cursor and I apologize. Um, this uh, orange star on the left plot shows you the building where I grew up and the red rectangle at bottom is the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research Grounds. You can see it's right up against the Arabian Sea. So the stuff that you see on the left, the way left of this image, the satellite image is the Arabian Sea. Um, it was a very, very uh, special and unique place because Bombay is this multitude of human masses and uh, Tata Institute for Fundamental Research was just uh, idyllic. It was like a resort in the middle of Bombay. Um, here are some pictures uh, of the seaside in Bombay. Here are the beautiful um, uh, uh, buildings. And on the right here is some gorgeous artwork in the main entryway into the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research, a very special research institution in India. It was founded by Homi Baba. Um, and uh, and uh, it continues to nurture some of the um, scientists, including, I learned, Sri, who uh, started her uh, PhD work in Tata Institute. Um, okay, so my education, I got my bachelor's in mathematics and in physics and also philosophy at University of Michigan. Um, I was one class away from actually majoring in philosophy, uh, but it was um, uh, enough to teach me that philosophy was fascinating, but probably not my cup of tea. Mathematics to me was truly beautiful, um, but again, I knew I would not be a research mathematician. I was not cut out for that. Um, and physics uh, was um, sort of the thing that was closest to speaking to me and my interests growing up. Uh, I really wanted to do biology, but I did not want to do wet lab biology. I just did not think I had the mental organization to um, manage lab work. And I didn't want to be doing things that were repetitive. And so I just kept doing physics, thinking that I would bide my time until I could find a way to do biology without doing wet lab biology, without knowing what that would look like. Um, so I uh, got my master's in physics uh, at Harvard. So I joined Harvard, got my master's, got my PhD there as well. Um, and um, at Harvard, uh, I was uh, casting around for um, something to do in, in, in biology um, during my PhD. Uh, and there I took uh, uh, some classes both at Harvard and MIT. And uh, while I was um, taking a class at MIT, uh, I, uh, uh, I was looking around for biology related classes. There wasn't a lot of biophysics at Harvard other than the traditional biophysics. In fact, Dave Waits had just joined. Um, and, uh, but uh, again, that was more experimental work. And so at MIT, I found a course by Sebastian Sung, who was uh, also a physicist by training. He had worked with um, David Nelson. And uh, Sebastian was working in theoretical neuroscience, but the class he taught was a systems biology class in general and uh, computational and theoretical approaches to systems biology. So we studied many beautiful things, including the repressilator and various other you know, gene protein network interaction models. We studied Nicholas Menton kinetics. At the very end, we studied a little bit about neuroscience and I finally learned what a neuron was, but um, I wasn't much less naive than knowing just that a neuron is, um, has an axon, which is its output end, and dendrites, which are its input end. Um, and without knowing much beyond that, I decided that the class was so much fun and Sebastian was such a wonderful teacher that I would like to join his group. And I was fortunate that he accepted me. Um, I went on to do my postdoc as an independent fellow in Santa Barbara, this beautiful place again by the sea. And um, I was a board fellow at Caltech. Uh, so oh, I have to mention um, the, my mentors um, at the stage. And so uh, I just wanna, again, I cannot move this bar. Shri, I'm going to just escape out so I can move the bar off to the side here. Go for it. Yeah, all right. And then I'll play this again. Yeah, so um, my first um, scientific influence was uh, Megan Aronson, uh, and she was my mentor at University of Michigan as an undergrad, where I did research with her in low temperature condensed matter physics. 
um, studying some uh, unusual magnetoresistance properties in um, rare earth hexaborides. Uh, I worked, um, my first experience in biophysics research was with Chuck Block at Indiana University in a, um, a radiation, a medical radiation uh, proton therapy uh, facility. And there, Chuck Block, uh, you know, gave me my first taste of biophysics research. And um, that was, I think, what made me sure that I still wanted to do biology. And then I already mentioned Sebastian Sung, my PhD advisor, who um, was just a wonderful example of a physicist doing uh, quantitative and theoretical biology. So that was my first sincere effort at, you know, um, trying to understand how it is that with a physics background, you could do something in neuroscience. And Sebastian was the ideal guide for this. And Daniel Fisher was my mentor at Harvard in physics, who agreed to sign off on my physics PhD, even though it was substantively in neuroscience. And uh, we've um, had a wonderful relationship ever since. Um, he takes an interest in neuroscience and humors um, me in many conversations and neuroscience when I have a chance to meet him. Um, I've had a bunch of other critical um, influences. So uh, two of the summers, uh, the last two summers I was in grad school, I visited Bell Labs um, uh, in Murray Hill, New Jersey. And of course, Bell Labs has a storied uh, history in um, physics research. Uh, it was the last few years before um, uh, Bell Labs um, sort of was uh, winding down uh, already. Its physics division had wound down a lot, but nevertheless, there were some amazing people um, there in those last couple of years when I visited, Michael Fee and David Tank, both physicists who uh, had um, started doing neuroscience research, and um, uh, that began the beginning, uh, that was the beginning of many fruitful collaborations that have continued since then. Um, Christophe Koch, also a physicist, um, Jules Laurent, a veterinarian turned neuroscientist, um, they were my postdoc mentors. Um, okay, other critical influences have been uh, my family. Uh, as hard as it is to have um, a family while coming up, you know, in science and uh, going uh, uh, tenure track uh, and, and, and then um, going from associate to full, all the rigors of academic life are also, um, you know, moderated by having uh, children who can keep you sane and can uh, draw your focus away from your work occasionally so that when you return to your work, you renew, return with a renewed focus. So my children have just been a very strong influence in my life and my husband, a theoretical physicist, um, has been uh, an even stronger influence um, uh, who's been very supportive and without him, I could not have made it in science. So, okay, failures, turning points and advice. Um, actually, uh, JC mentioned this and uh, I did not put this in here after she mentioned it, this is something I've spoken to uh, um, uh, about with my group members, and I've also mentioned in a few other talks, in fact, uh, I think it's not uncommon for women in science to suffer from depression and anxiety, and I have also had um, a very fair share of depression and anxiety with many bouts, um, starting in periods in graduate school and in postdoc, but I'm very fortunate that these are also highly treatable conditions. And so I found a way to, um, if not embrace, but at least continue working despite having depression and anxiety. Um, I found, you know, supportive um, doctors and others who can, you know, help me manage the condition. And I guess, you know, there are also upsides on some level of depression and anxiety. It makes you maybe more empathetic um, to other people who might also struggle in life. So I would say that if you have struggles, maybe that's a way to think about how it improves your empathy. Um, towards others. So I think it's been maybe not really an asset, but uh, I guess it has certainly been part of who I am and part of my trajectory in science. And I just want to say that it's possible to make it um, in science uh, despite uh, obstacles. So who does not have obstacles in life? Uh, two body problem. Uh, this was something that, you know, we had to face. We've been very lucky. It's not been a problem in the sense that uh, just great good fortune led us to be able to find positions together all the way from grad school. My husband and I were in the same PhD program together. We went to both postdocs at the same place, joined our first faculty positions together, and we're in Boston now in the same place again. So it hasn't been a problem. I think that um, it can, again, also be an opportunity. I think that as much as you're both busy as um, joint, uh, both uh, faculty members, um, um, you know, trying to get tenure at the same time, but nevertheless, you uniquely understand each other's 
uh, constraints and you understand why the other person is so busy and not spending any time with you. And they are also uniquely positioned to give you advice and support. So I would say that it's been um, all in all, um, you know, again, a very positive thing to have a partner in science, um, even um, though it's been challenging. Um, female in science, I'm often asked this question of, you know, did I experience a lot of um, disadvantages or, 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 or um, discrimination? Again, I'm very fortunate that I did not um, ever feel explicit discrimination as a female in science, although structurally there are a lot of um, differences between how women and men approach meetings, approach discussions, approach science. And um, again, sometimes this, this differences are a strength. I think there is strength in science. But I think that, uh, yeah, I think that there are some unique struggles and I'm very happy to speak with anybody offline um, who would like to discuss um, any of those questions. Uh, when to have kids, I had children um, at a time which uh, worked out extremely well for me. Um, when I was in my postdoc years, uh, I had these independent fellow positions and those turned out to be a really good times to have a, a child and start a family. Uh, I was able to do paper writing uh, when expecting and when the kids were um, infants and uh, at least our first one. And then I started my faculty position. So I felt like um, I started my faculty position one year in after having our first child and that made for a less stressful tenure track process. Um, so I guess I've gone pretty long. So I just want to um, say um, three things. One thing that I've learned along the way, um, there is no such thing as wasted knowledge. So I learned philosophy, I learned math. Um, and uh, I learned physics and now I'm doing neuroscience and I will say that I have not wasted any of the mathematics I've learned or the philosophy. It's amazing how things like um, number theory and topology have now been cropping up for my work in neuroscience and uh, maybe if I hadn't studied those things, I would not have seen those aspects of the mathematics in the work that I do. So I guess even something that feels quite useless is not, um, it'll always be useful. Um, the other thing as a biologist now that I tell biology students is um, that another advantage of a mathematical statement is that it is so definite that it might be definitely wrong. So this is um, just some advice that I really enjoyed reading from Lewis Fry Richardson, The Mathematics of War and Fowler in Politics, um, but uh, we struggle to communicate the utility of mathematics and computation and um, uh, equations in biology sometimes, and I guess this has been a very handy um, uh, uh, answer to give for what the use and utilities are for mathematics in, in biology. And finally, the last thing that I want to leave you with is that all paths in science uh, are uh, syncretic and unique. And actually, this is a huge asset. The more different your background, the more different and potentially creative and new your viewpoint is in science and in mentoring. So I'll leave it at that. Um, here are a couple of resources. And if you're interested um, in, um, in, in pursuit, pre-using pre these. Um, thank you so much, Ilao, on behalf of the audience um, for this terrific and inspiring talk. Uh, in the interest of time, I will take one burning question from me. <laughs> I feel like I just have to ask this question um, and I'll try to make the question short and give you a minute for answering. You represent uh, or embody the hopes and aspirations of substantial fraction of a country of billion people, especially the women, uh, in terms of being a physics prof in the ivory tower who has been, uh, you know, in so many aspirational uh, places and uh, represents hopes and dreams of so many people. So I want you to quickly tell us how we can have many, many, many more ELAs living these lives. Well, Shri, you know, I have been so um, inspired actually to see how many women and Indian women and not just women and Indian women, but just, you know, so many people from so many different backgrounds coming to science. I mean, look, when we were in grad school, it was really rare for there to be women right in, 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 in physics programs uh, as, as theoretical physicists. Uh, uh, and now, you know, I see my, I mean, my husband is still in physics and theoretical physics, and he sees so many more women when he goes to the APS March meeting, there are actually women at the meeting. Now, um, I think that already, you know, the, the word is getting out, right? I, I think science is becoming a more welcoming 
um, field. And I think the work continues. I think it's something that I think we have to do more than the women have to do, right? Like it's not, it's not that there's something different that the young people have to do coming up, you know, to make it. I think we have to make the field uh, a place that, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, it, it should be clear that there, you know, you don't have to have come up in STEM, I guess, you know, at a younger age, there's no too late time at which you can be fascinated by mathematics and fascinated by physics and there's no right gender and there's no right like race. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, I think people are getting that message more and more and that's why we're seeing a change. Uh, is it fast enough? I don't know. I read some statistics um, that actually the number of women in physics has has dropped in physics programs. And I don't know if that's strictly true. I, I read that three years ago. Um, and um, so, I mean, that suggests that there's still some more work that we need to do. And I, I don't understand why that's true. I think we have some structural issues in our field. Uh, I think that still, despite what I said about, you know, uh, having a supporting spouse and having children and, and how that makes for, you know, better science, I think nevertheless, like logistically, it is very, very difficult. And if I had not had a very supporting, supportive partner, I don't know if I would have made it. You know, there's so many periods where science can be difficult. Uh, so, but, you know, I think that science is a lot of fun. And I think that if we can communicate that it's fun and everybody has hardships, I think it will level the playing field. Um, on that, on that um, high note, um, thank you again on behalf of the audience. And um, I'm closing the recording.